Let's imagine for a second that some of our friends one day get together to protest against corruption, okay? And let's imagine that when they are protesting, the police comes by and takes them. And then our, our friends disappear. It's scary, right? Well, that's exactly what happened two years ago in a small Mexican city where 43 students were protesting against the, go the, the, the corruption in the government. And the police came by, kidnapped them, and all of them disappeared. So at this point, we don't even know if they're alive or not. All we know is that these two individuals ordered the action. They were the leaders of the criminal organization. Everything is shocking and scary about this case of violence and corruption. But there is a particular characteristic that makes this case even more difficult to understand. And it's the fact that the person who ordered the action was actually the mayor of the city. That's even more scary, right? And that's difficult to understand because it's not clear for us how is it possible that a public servant in a relevant public position is at the same time the leader of a criminal organization. And to understand why it's so difficult to make sense of that situation, I want to invite you to think on the concept of organized crime. So for a second, please think what do we imagine when we speak about organized crime? Unfortunately, how we imagine crime is a lot more simplified and, as I'll show you, even wrong, than what crime is in reality. So this is the typical organizational chart that journalists, policymakers, enforcement agents around the world use to define a criminal organization. But this idea of crime is too simple. In fact, this is how the Mexican authorities defined a criminal organization known as La Familia Michoacana in 2010. But with my research group, we wanted to understand if this was really the structure of such a powerful criminal group. So we gathered judicial information to identify individuals and interactions that sustained La Familia Michoacana. And the result was a lot more complex than what we initially thought. At the beginning, we were thinking about 15 full-time criminals, bad people, isolated from the rest of society. At the beginning, we thought that La Familia Michoacana was this closed group that was operating at the other side of the rest of us. However, the reality was that La Familia Michoacana consisted of more than 800 not only full-time criminals, but especially mayors and policemen. So that's the first idea that I want to leave in your minds today. The huge gap between the theoretical way of understanding crime and the reality. And I think that that gap is not only wrong, but that it's dangerous to think in those terms. Why is that? Because when we think in those terms, in terms of the classic 
criminal organizations, pyramidal structures. We focus our attention as society on the criminal leader, on the Pablo Escobar of the moment. And we assume, we think, that that leader concentrates all the information and all the power in the structure. So we think that chasing that individual is enough for making the entire structure to collapse. And every enforcement agency around the world usually think in those terms. However, that's not only wrong, because pyramidal structures do not fall when you remove the peak of the structure, but it's also wrong because in reality, there is not a single criminal mastermind that concentrates all the power. In fact, here we're looking at La Familia Michoacana again, but we are, but we are looking at the subnetworks of the structure. And now we can see that this is actually a decentralized structure, that there is not a single criminal mind that we can remove to make the entire structure collapse. In fact, if we zoom in in one of those substructures, we're going to see that a subnetwork is articulated into the main web, into the main network of interactions by a public servant. Because here, the codes beginning with the letters F-U-N represent public servants. So this means that when we focus our attention only on the Pablo Escobar of the moment, we don't understand all the complexity of money and political power sustaining that Pablo Escobar. So this explains, and this explains why criminal structures around the world remain untouched, despite the fact that usually the criminal bosses are changing, are constantly changing. In fact, El Chapo Guzman, the famous Chapo Guzman, leader of the Sinaloa cartel, explained this to our friend Sean Penn in the famous interview at Rolling Stone. So the Chapo Guzman said, the day I don't exist, Drug trafficking is not going to decrease in any way at all. Drug trafficking does not depend on one person. And what do you think that happened when after the interview, El Chapo Guzman was captured? Do you think that the structure, that the criminal structure collapsed? Do you think that the Sinaloa cartel does not exist? Anymore? Do you think that drug trafficking changed in Mexico or the entire Western Hemisphere? I can tell you, the answer is no. Zero change. Nothing happened. And that's why that is the case, because the politicians, the people with money, the public servants, are still operating and no one's paying attention to them. So why is it important to overcome this classic idea of crime? I hope it's evident for you now, but I want to mention, mention some specific cases in which understanding crime in classic terms, in these traditional terms, is dangerous. For example, let's leave Mexico and let's go to Bulgaria, Eastern Europe, where huge criminal structures that involve public servants kidnap women to sell them to rich European countries, to force them into sexual work. And let's go to Africa, 
where huge criminal structures enslaved children to force them to extract coal, the same mineral that then ends up in our cell phones and our laptops. In fact, those children are also forced to participate in militias. And something very similar happens in Colombia, where the luxury of gold begins with an, an extraction that destroys the environment and that actually poison the poor farmers involved in that destruction because they use mercury the entire day. And the same happens with rhinos because there is a criminal market for the rhino horn powder. Some people in China and Vietnam think that the rhino horn powder has medicine powers. So they sometimes pay even more for rhino horn powder than for gold. And that explains why criminal structures are killing and destroying the entire rhino species. Although rhino horn has nothing your own nails can have, as Richard Branson reminds us. And the same happens with pangolin, a beautiful small animal that most of us don't even know about, but is the most trafficked mammal in the world. Because there is also a market for its skin in Vietnam and China. As you can imagine at this point, I could keep just listing and listing cases of huge criminal structures. And that's why the second idea that I want to leave in your, in your minds today is that in order to confront all these problems, all these forms of traffic, we need to understand criminal structures. Criminal, understanding criminal structures is ground zero for this battle. So I hope that you are asking yourselves what to do. What should we do? Well, the first and most important task is to talk and to expose these structures. Because now that you recognize the gap, now you know that the iceberg remains unchanged. So we need to put light on those regions, on those areas where bankers, famous people, politicians, keep providing money and power for the, for the criminal structures. Because fighting crime is not only about being a cop. Fighting rhino horn trafficking is not only about being a cop in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. Fighting crime is also about exposing these structures, exposing these famous and powerful people. To facilitate that, with my research group, we have been working during the last years designing some tools that I want to share with you today. The first one, today, for the first time in public, I want to present the Global Observatory of Transnational Criminal Networks, an initiative in which we invited journalists, research institutes, scholars, and activists from Brazil, South Africa, Senegal, Spain, from around the world to come discuss this problem and to expose networks of crime and corruption. So I want to invite you to engage in this discussion, criminalnetworks.org. And there, you are also going to find this tool, which is a massive visualization for observing and understanding the transnational movement of trafficked resources. But we need more data. We need more information. We need to process more cases. 
And that's why I want to invite you today to engage in this, in this battle, in this fight. As another tool that I want to share with you, I want to tell you about these documentaries in which Vortex, the research group that I direct, worked researching to understand eight criminal markets from around the world to support the production of eight films about these criminal markets. So I want to invite you, because this November, these films are going to be released so you can use them as a tool to boost this discussion. With the right money, you can buy anything. Drugs, exotic animals, sex, and even human body parts. Fusion presents. Why did you want to talk to me? Nella Farhadiyat takes you on a global journey. We've walked into a trafficking house. The buyers. I gave him the money. In return, I got his kidney. The sellers. Really, it's a lot of money. Inside billion dollar black markets, hiding in plain sight. But this sounds to me like legalized trafficking. The Traffickers premieres November 13th on Fusion. Unfortunately, with the right money, you can buy anything. But now, all of us here know that this is not only about the buyer and the seller. Now we know that always there is a criminal market that involves great players, part-time criminals, people playing between the legal and the illegal sectors of society. So I want to invite you to participate in this discussion, to have an active role, because as I just told you, we need more data. We need to understand the complexity of criminal structures from around the world. Unfortunately, no one's paying attention to this issue. Because every second that we don't care about this, it's a second in which we, we condemn millions of people, especially children, to the darkness of corruption and crime. Don't get me wrong, because my, my idea today is not to get you too depressed. In fact, I need you to have hope ab about this. Because I know that the world is actually doing great. I know that we, as humans, we have amazing tools, we have amazing technology, we have amazing economic resources, and actually peaceful regions around the world. However, in several countries across Latin America, especially Central America, Eastern Europe, and West Africa, things are not going that well. And that's why we need to participate in this. Because every second that we don't do it, we lose human lives. And that's something that we cannot afford to do. Thank you.